Yes, slightly false pretenses. In fact, it was a desktop search, uh, so <laughs> nothing new. Uh, I just put uh, some things together, perhaps in ways that hadn't quite uh, happened before. <coughs> As uh, Chloe was saying, this year marks the bicentenary of the first published music from the Isle of Man in the Mona Melodies. And if you look on the sheet here, there is a copy of a notice dated the 18th of July, 1820, which announced that copies of it were now available in the house of Mr. Barrow. This is Mr. Charles Barrow in Douglas. And he was a music teacher, piano tuner. Uh, he ran a music business, including selling sheet music. And he was also the organist in St George's Church. In an obituary notice published by his wife, Mary Culliford, in, on his death in 1826, she proudly described him as late of Somerset House, London, so eminently respectable. Well, after working in London with the Culliford family musical business and on his own account as a music teacher, Charles Barrow was appointed in 1801, perhaps through his own family connections, to work in the Navy pay office in Somerset House. And he could have continued to work in Somerset House, drawing a salary of £330 per year, had he not been found to have been systematically embezzling twice as much as that <laughs> per year, to a total of £5,700. <laughs> and so faced with prosecution in early 1811, he fled to Douglas with his <laughs> wife Mary and at least one son, John Henry Barrow, to take advantage of the island as a legal sanctuary beyond the law of Britain and Ireland. Well, rather as Barrow the embezzler, uh, Charles Barrow was known in Douglas for his music business and teaching, and he took part in concerts in Douglas and Castletown. Douglas, in particular, had a large society of legal sanctuary seekers, shall we say, <laughs> particularly escaping debts, and also those uh, half-pay military officers and others eking out limited means in a place where the cost of living was inexpensive. Now, on the sheet here, you'll see that the music arranger of the Mona Melodies is described simply as an amateur. The description given in the collection and in the circumstances of the production show that this was Charles Barrow, and his was the guiding hand on the Mona Melodies. Now, Charles Barrow, if you get a chance to read it, there is a copy over there on the stand. In the, what is called the advertisement, it's uh, uh, an introduction, says that some gentlemen brought him transcriptions of Manx songs. Now, perhaps they'd heard these from Manx people, marketplace, the taverns, uh, perhaps from servants or trade people. And it looks as though Charles Barrow identified an opportunity here. Romantic nationalism had been developing during the 18th century, the work of Robert Burns particularly, in collecting and adding to Scottish balladry led to musical settings being made by London resident at the time, Josef Haydn. So songs with a national provenance and with Haydn-esque settings became very much the order of the day. And in 1808 came the first set of the Irish melodies, music by Sir John Stevenson in a Haydn style. And that was a series that was conti to continue until 1834 with lyrics nothing to do with the original Irish language songs, but redolent of a romantic island written in English by Thomas More. And I think we can surmise that Charles Barrow, being a seller of music, would no doubt have handled the Burns settings and the Irish melodies, and he saw that these songs that these gentlemen had brought him from the Isle of Man were unknown, different in some way. And he himself had a very personal reason uh, to recognise the Isle of Man as a separate jurisdiction. <laughs> so uh, perhaps there'd be a market for these songs in that spirit of romantic nationalism. An advertisement for the Mona Melodies points out that it's in the same format as the Irish Melodies. And like the Irish Melodies, it was decided that lyrics in Gaelic wouldn't do. So it was out with the Manx language. And when it came to it, it was decided even a translation of the words was inappropriate, so the tunes would get completely new lyrics. Now, there are two editions of the Mona Melodies, and one shows the words, as here, the words by Mr J.B. But the other edition shows the words by Mr J. Barrow. Now, according to one writer, Charles Barrow's son, John Henry Barrow, had written... Manx Legends, and it's described as a small collection of poems from the Manx tradition. Now again, I think we can surmise that Charles Barrow decided to use these as the new English lyrics for these melodies that had been brought to him. 
And some of John Barrow's pieces refer to stories from Manx history and folklore, and they've been referenced in earlier books uh, about the island. Now, these poems may have been used as a matter of pragmatism. They were available to him. He had melodies. He wanted lyrics. He wanted lyrics in English. Here were lyrics in English. Although some of them changed the rhyming scheme of the original tune. We know Ilium Dawn in the Manx as A-A-B-B. -B. But in the version that's in the Mona Melodies, it becomes A-B-A-B. So perhaps because of that, and because of limitations of poems pressed into service as lyrics, and perhaps because poetry wasn't in fact John Barrow's forte, uh, some of the words sit maybe a little uncomfortably with the music. Charles Barrow, for his part, set these lyrics to melodies uh, and accompaniments in Haydn-esque style, though not necessarily understanding how to adapt the harmonies for modal tunes. Nevertheless, here we have the lyrics in English, we have Haydn-esque musical settings. How is this now to be promoted? Well, rather than take a chance on the open market, subscriptions were to be invited. And here we have the third name that appears on the sheet there. And we have dedicated permission to Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Kent by Her Royal Highness's grateful and devoted humble servant, C. St. George. As a widow, Catherine Maddox, had come to Douglas with her nine children sometime about 1807-1808. She ran a school for young ladies and continued to do so after her marriage when she became Mrs. Catherine St. George in 1809. Uh, she was married not in the church, although by the, bishop, uh, by the uh, uh, clergyman of Onken, they were married at Haywood House, which was the school she was teaching in. The aim of having a patron was to secure someone prestigious in hopes to inspire others to become subscribers to this book that you were promoting. Mainly, I suppose, for the snob value. <laughs> but in 1817, Mrs. St. George had written a novel. It's called Maria, a domestic tale. And I started reading it today, and there's a lot of autobiography in it, so I'm looking forward to reading the rest of it. She notably for that one secured as a patron Princess Charlotte. Princess Charlotte was the heir presumptive to George IV, being the only legitimate child of the King and Caroline of Brunswick. I think we have to surmise that, noting Mrs St George's success in obtaining this patron, she was enlisted to do so for the Mona Melodies, and she succeeded in dedicating the Mona Melodies, as we see here, to Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Kent. Now, the Duchess of Kent was Princess Elizabeth of saxe coburg saalfeld and she was married to George IV's brother, Edward, the Duke of Kent. After the sudden death of Mrs St George's earlier patron, the Princess Charlotte, whilst George IV and his brother William IV had many children, they were all by royal mistresses rather than their wives, and the Kents produced the legitimate heir presumptive in Princess Alexandra Victoria in 1819, and she succeeded her uncle William IV in 1837 as Queen Victoria. The Kents subscribed for various copies, several copies of the Mona Melodies, and among other subscribers were various other royal highnesses, honourables, ambassadors, and ladies and gentlemen, and the list of subscribers shows about 280 subscription copies. Well, I mentioned that in 1820 the Mona Melodies was advertised as now available. Well, that's scarcely true today. Another copy has very recently been found. But there are otherwise only two complete copies known, one in the Manx Museum and the other in the University of Glasgow Ewing Collection. And there are three partial copies, one of which is in the Manx Museum and two in the British Library. However, amongst these copies, there are two editions identifiable, one naming Catherine St George, but the other not. And perhaps the difference is between the subscription copies and those for general sale. Well, whilst there may be some small moments in the lyrics or in the arrangements, the Mona Melodies brings us the first published music from the Isle of Man and presents it in an enjoyable form. And it gives us some background information as well. Later collectors also found some of these tunes in forms which suggest that the Mona Melodies were by any means aberrations. So, 200 years on, we owe a debt of gratitude to Charles Barrow, whatever the circumstances that led him to be here, he was the musical arranger and driving force behind the project. To his son, John Barrow, for providing the lyrics, which enabled the project to go forward, and to Catherine St George,
for encouraging subscribers to enable the work to be published. And it's by their efforts that we are brought the first ever printed collection of music from the Isle of Man in the Mona Melodies. Right.